this video, I'd like to talk to you about a really unique way of drawing with a Fude nib fountain pen. This is something that can only be done with a Fude nib and creates an effect that actually doesn't look like it was done with a pen at all. For those of you that have never seen a Fude nib, I have an introductory video on my channel, but to briefly summarize, it looks like this. The bend in the nib allows you to control line width with changes of angle, so that if the pen is held more vertically, it'll create an extra fine line, like so. And then, as I flatten the angle, like so, it'll increase the line width. If you'd like to know more about Fudi nibs in general, and see my recommendations for what pens to purchase, I'll leave a link to that video below. But, if you already know what Fudi pens are, and used it for drawing, I think you'll find this video interesting. We know that the food nib is a remarkably versatile drawing tool, but what I'd like to show you today is what it can do when the going literally gets rough. When you draw with it on rough textured paper, such as this cold pressed watercolor paper made by Arches. This type of paper is not really designed for normal fountain pens, and though I occasionally do it, it's a somewhat scratchy experience. The bend of the food nib, however, glides over the surface smoothly and creates something that looks like dry brush, which is a popular technique where an artist uses a slightly moistened brush to create rough textures, like this. By the way, this is a Twisby 580 that I have fitted with a custom number 5 food nib made by FP Nims, a Spanish company specializing in all kinds of nib grinds. My introduction to the Fude nib has lots of other far less expensive options, but this combination of pen body and nib is just about my favorite. As you can see, with light pressure, it creates a light, scrapey stroke, which is really great for sketching things in at the beginning of the drawing process. And then, if I press down, it can make a heavier line. It also still responds perfectly well to angle, going from thin to thick with ease. It almost feels like you're drawing with a charcoal pencil and not a pen. It's very easy to control, and I find that it gives me access to a huge library of different strokes and textures, way more than I can get with an ordinary fountain pen. Here's a little hack that only really works with piston fillers like this Twisby 580. If you need to put down a wetter line or to fill in a large area with ink, you can give the knob a slight turn, like so, which will saturate the feed and put down a much wetter line. And then, conversely, if I need the pen to put down a drier line, I'll simply dry off the nib with a paper towel like so, and it'll immediately write a lot drier. To my mind, this technique is really great for sketching landscapes because of its unique ability to render rough organic textures such as rocks, tree bark, leaves, grass, and so on. So for instance, for rocks, I can do something like this. Put in cracks. For tree bark, I can do stuff like this. leaves. Branches. So here are a few little examples of sketches that I did using the Fude pen. And I really think that the rough Fude pen adds character and energy to these relatively quick sketches in a way that a regular fountain pen probably could not. By the way, it can also be used for more precise work. Uh, here are two pages from a graphic novel that I've been working on. And as you can see, the Fude nib can be used for really fine line work and even delicate cross hatching. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate how I sketch a landscape with a Fude pen in combination with watercolor. I have my drawing already very lightly penciled in, and since there are no complicated architectural details here, the initial sketch is fairly rough, indicating the basic shapes of the tree trunks, patches of snow on the ground, etc. I've used my usual HB pencil here to do the sketch. 
The waterproof ink I'm using in the pen is called Document Brown, made by D. Atramentis, a German company that makes excellent products. I have a full review of this ink, the link to which I'll leave down below, but to summarize, I really like it. The dark brown color is reminiscent of a traditional walnut ink, its flow is excellent, and it dries pretty fast, so I don't have to wait for long periods of time before going in with watercolor. I also really like the way this warm brown complements all of the cooler colors that are often found in landscape. Black ink is great, and I use it often, but it can also make the work feel more graphic, whereas brown blends into the colors a little more and gives the piece a softer, more atmospheric feel. As for the pen, as I mentioned, this is a Twisby 580, fitted with a number 5 steel Yovo nib that was turned into a Fude nib by FP Nibs. This company did a fantastic job of this, and it works very well. I also have a number 6 and a number 4 Fude nib made by them, and I'm pleased to report that they do excellent, consistent work. I strongly recommend this combination of nib and this pen. Having a comfortable pen with a large ink capacity, being able to instantly see what kind of ink you're using and how much is left is pretty important, and the Twisby 580 definitely checks off all of those boxes. As to be expected, the lines you put down have slightly rough edges, and the line quality overall is a bit jagged. I think in this case, it really complements the subject matter, allowing me to accentuate all the different textures I'm seeing. I'm trying to make use of the Fudi nib's exceptional ability to vary line thickness, making lines thicker and more heavily textured toward the foreground to accentuate closeness, and the lines thinner in areas that are further away to emphasize distance. I'm trying not to make the lines overly faint, however, in anticipation that I'm going to go over this drawing in watercolor. This is something that can be difficult to anticipate at times, and quite often I find that at the end of my sketches that I didn't make my lines dark enough. This isn't a huge problem, however, since you can always reinforce your lines towards the end. I'm doing something that I usually don't do in my landscape drawing, which is putting in a lot of cross-hatching. While I love it for figure drawing, when it comes to landscape, I usually use it in a much more limited way, mostly relying on washes to give my sketches value. In this case, however, in order to show off just how versatile the Fude pen can be, I decided to hatch a little bit more. Hatching, if applied judiciously, can reinforce a sense of form and depth in your sketch and add a little bit of visual excitement. One of the fantastic things about Fude pens and one way they're actually better for drawing than a flexible nib fountain pen is that they don't put down a tremendous amount of ink when applying a thick line. In the case of a flex pen, putting down pressure increases the ink flow, and in some pens that flow can be very, very heavy, which puts down a very wet line that takes forever to dry. A Fude nib spreads the ink in a thin layer, which dries much faster, and also does a better job showing off the transparency of the ink. I'll have to do a more detailed comparison between flex and Fude pens in a separate video, but that's just one example of where Fude pens win out. Now, some artists that I have introduced a Fude nib to say that it's uncomfortable, or that they can't imagine holding their pens that way. While I agree that it takes some getting used to, I actually like the fact that it takes you out of your comfort zone and forces you to draw in a novel way. I think the main reason why I like fountain pens so much is the huge variety of nibs out there, not just in terms of thickness, but also flexibility, flow, and geometry. I will sometimes buy a pen for its appearance or need filling mechanisms, but mostly what I'm collecting are different nibs. I love it when I encounter a nib that has unique properties, because it forces me to adjust to it, bringing out some aspect in the drawing that's surprising and exciting. It's analogous to the way a change in pianos or some other musical instrument might inspire a musician to bring out new facets in their musical interpretation. Or the way a new ingredient might confuse a chef at first, but then lead to the creation of a new recipe or a cooking method, or however you want to think about it. So yes, drawing with a Fude nib is uncomfortable at the beginning, but not to get overly philosophical, being too comfortable is a dangerous place to be as an artist, because it inhibits growth. I see too many artists settling in on a formula, the same materials, same subjects, same work over and over and over again. My advice is to always seek ways to be uncomfortable, by trying new materials or tackling new and challenging subject matter. That will lead to growth, even if you are a very proficient artist. Okay, now I'm starting to go in with watercolor. This is a sketch, not a detailed painting, so I'm trying to simplify what is clearly a jumbled and complicated motif. Having lines that already reinforce some sense of form and depth relieve a little bit of pressure here, and I can be less accurate with my color mixing and looser with my applications of washes than if I was doing pure watercolor. I really like doing pure watercolor too when I have a little bit more time. But when I want to do a faster sketch, pen and ink and watercolor is my preferred medium. Besides, I really like the tension that occurs when controlled line meets looser washes and the complex interplay between line, color, and texture that this medium offers. The inter intricacies of color mixing watercolor technique are best left to another video, but to summarize, here are a few basic points. I start by laying in the lightest color of every part of my sketch, blocking in large areas, focusing primarily on atmospheric perspective. If you're not familiar with the principles of atmospheric perspective, I recommend you research it because it's essential to creating a convincing sense of depth. In short, 
it's the propensity of colors in the distance to lose saturation and become more blue. In other words, colors that are saturated and closer to blue will look like they're further away, and colors that are more saturated and closer to either yellow or red will look like they're closer. Since I'm working from a photograph, I'm forced to exaggerate this effect, since the camera is not as sensitive to atmospheric perspective as the human eye. This, by the way, is why it's common for beginners to be told by their professors to avoid working from photographs. Photographs distort and simplify value and color, and because they're flat, make it very difficult to understand the forms you're drawing. However, once you have a few years of drawing and painting from observation under your belt, you can use a photograph as reference and add color and value nuance that the photograph has lost. Here's another important point. It's easier to get a variety of greens by mixing them out of your yellows and blues rather than using green pigment. I do have a number of greens in my palette, but usually use them only when I need to saturate my mixture of yellow and blue. They are rarely my first option. There's nothing wrong with using green pigment, but mixing your greens out of other colors will allow you to focus on exactly what kind of green you need, making for more sensitive color choices. For making shadows and greens, avoid just using a darker version of the same color you used in the light. I usually mix some kind of purple into my shadow color. The red in the mixture will desaturate the color, red being the opposite of green, while the blue and the purple will make the color a little more blue, which tends to be the case in shadows. Mixing your greens is one of the more difficult aspects of landscape painting. Try to mix a large variety of greens and keep asking yourself, how is this green different from that green? The more color shifts you can capture, particularly in your greens, the better your painting will be. A few additional points. When creating shadows, try to avoid using black. Black pigment is a bit of a bully and doesn't mix well with other colors. You'll find that you'll get better results if instead you use some combination of brown and blue. This can be either burnt umber and ultramarine blue for darker shadows, or for more delicate, lighter shadows, such colors as cobalt blue and burnt sienna. Another important point is to avoid going too dark in the shadows. This applies to pure watercolor as well, but is super important when working with pen and ink. Keep the watercolor washes light enough so that the ink is the absolutely darkest value. Otherwise, if your washes are too dark, all the hard work you've done with all your line work will be lost. I'm finishing things up here by going back in with my pen. As mentioned at the beginning, when doing your line work, it's important to make your lines darker and heavier in anticipation of the watercolor washes to come, which will lower the contrast and potentially threaten to make your lines invisible. These things are hard to predict, however, so I often go back in with my pen at the end to push the details and textures a bit and to give my line quality a little bit more pop. And here's my finished sketch. I hope you found this demonstration of the Fude Nib on watercolor paper useful. I really think that this is a very interesting, versatile way to sketch, and I'm looking forward to exploring the possibilities of this medium. I'm also curious to see if other people have tried this and what the results have been. Thanks for watching, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll do my best to respond.